Okay, I think we can start. Inspired by Igor's reminiscing about being here first uh, for the first time 27 years ago, I thought I would reminisce that I was for the first time here 28 years ago. Uh, I guess that's twice as long as Raphael's first time. And let's see. Yes, uh, I was here as, as a graduate student, and my, my advisor, Kumran Bafo, was here for a month. So I spent the month here with him. And the organizers of the school, the summer school, kindly asked me to give a, a lecture here. I think I, I gave a couple of lectures. So this was my first time lecturing in, in a big room, was, was here in this room. And um, well, th this, is, this is mostly for Igor. So this was the proceedings from that in 1990. And let's see, this is mostly for Igor, because the, the number is 9108005, fifth, fifth paper on the archive. <laughs> yeah, if you want to see the, um, the first papers on the archive, these are the first ones. Uh, also on this trip, I, I met uh, Sergio Ciccati for the first time, and we were then collaborating a paper with Kerman. OK. Uh, I guess I don't need this anymore. Ah, thank you. So th these were some things that I wanted to finish up with last time and didn't quite get to. So um, just to write, so I'll be discussing today uh, six-dimensional theories, starting with one-zero supersymmetry. And so one-zero supersymmetry has eight supercharges. This is the same number of supercharges as uh, 5D minimal supersymmetry, or as 4D n equals 2, or 3D n equals 4. And um, the supersymmetry algebra looks like this. So these are the supercharges. They're, um, this is a Lorentz 4, so it's in the 4 of the Lorentz group. And this is a SU2 R symmetry doublet. And we need two of them just in order to get the algebra to work right, because the, um, because this thing is symmetric and we get the vector by doing, making something that's anti-symmetric. If we anti-symmetrize two spinners, we could get a vector. And so we need this extra SU2 quantum number to get something to work right. Uh, here I put in parentheses that there are also central terms that could be added for BPS strings. These theories have uh, strings that can be BPS saturated. And so there's a central term here that, that's supported on strings. but I'll leave it off for the moment. And in terms of this group theory, um, these are the Lorentz quantum numbers. It's in the four of the Lorentz group. Uh, I put the R symmetry quantum number up here. So this is this one here means there's one box in the SU2 Dinkin diagram. So it's a doublet. So this is uh, four and a doublet of SU2 R. And so the stress tensor multiplet, for instance, has 40 bosonic and 40 fermionic degrees of freedom. One, one check of, of all of these multiplets is that they should have the same number of bosonic and fermionic fields. And so, for instance, the bottom of this field is a Lorentz scalar. Its dimension is 4. It's an R symmetry singlet. Then uh, when you act with the supercharge, you get some fermionic operators. When you act with the supercharge again, you get the SU2R currents. So this notation means this is a Lorentz vector, and this means it's in the adjoint of the SU2R symmetry. So that's the SU2R currents. These are some brain currents. Then when you act with another supercharge, you get the currents uh, whose integral gives the supercharges. So these, are in, these have a spinner index and a vector index, and it's a, it's a doublet under the R symmetry. So that's what this one is. And then when you act with one more supercharge, you get the stress tensor. And so this, this we always have in any conformal field theory. And the source for these, if we, it's often convenient to turn on sources for operators. Just like when you take field, introductory field theory, you turn on these sources for the operators, and then you can write down an effective action. 
And so if we want to track down sources for these operators, it would be the background supergravity multiplet. So if you're interested in uh, supergravity, those, you know, the metric couples to this, there's some SU2R gauge fields that can couple to this, et cetera. So that's the gravity multiplet. And here I'm not actually going to be discussing supergravity uh, as a dynamical theory, but just thinking about it as like backgrounds for these operators. Okay, then another multiplet that we could talk about is the flavor current multiplet. So flavor current multiplet has eight bosonic and eight fermionic operators. And what they look like is the bottom operator is a Lorentz scalar and it's, a, it's in the adjoint of the R symmetry. And these operators are sometimes called the moment map operators. They're also there if you look in four dimensional n equals two or uh, three dimensional n equals four, you have these same operators. And then um, when you act with the supercharges, you get these fermionic operators. And then at the top of the multiplet, these are the uh, currents. And so it's in the, um, it, it, it's in, it has a Lorentz vector index and it's a R symmetry singlet. And in terms of this counting, eight bosonic plus eight fermionic, I should say that this is, has three operators. This is like three bosonic operators because it's in the adjoint of the R symmetry. And this thing ha has five indices, but only has six indices rather, but only counts as five operators because of the conservation law. So this thing counts as five bosonic operators. So those are the eight bosonic operators, and then these are the eight fermionic operators. And, um, and, and this is also similar to what we would have if we went down in dimensions. So if we go down in dimension, we can go to like 5D n equals one, or to 4D n equals two, or to 3D n equals four. The difference is, is that when we dimensionally reduce, some of these Lorentz indices just become scalar indices. So like for instance, in 5D, instead of just having um, a Lorentz vector here, we have a 5D vector plus a scalar. And in 4D, we have a 4D vector plus two scalars. And in 3D, we would have a 3D, scalar, a 3D vector plus three scalars. And those scalar operators, when we go down to lower dimensions, give us uh, possible mass terms that we can add to the theory. Here, um, because there are no scalars, there's no associated mass term with these global symmetries in six dimensions. So maybe I'll just say here that there's no, unlike d less than six, no scalars. at the top of the multiplet. And yeah, corresponding to that, there are no masses. That we, that we can add. So we'll, I'll discuss also 5D, but in 5D and in 4D and in 3D, there, there are mass terms associated with the global currents, but in, in six dimensions there aren't. In fact, there, there are no, I, I mentioned this in the last lecture, there are no relevant operators in six dimensions. So this, this is an example of that. Now, um, when we want to add a source for these operators, those are background vector multiplets. So just like we could add here a source for the, um, the stress tensor, which is the supergravity multiplet, here we can add a source, which is the vector multiplet. So here I started to, to write a list of some of the multiplets that we have in in six dimensions. So we can write down a hypermultiplet, which is similar to 4dn equals two or 5dn equals one or 3dn equals four. This hypermultiplet has four bosonic and four fermionic operators. Um, and we can write down a vector multiplet. And this is also similar to lower dimensions except for there are no scalars. And that's just, just like here. There are because it couples to this, and so there are no scalars. So like, like in, um, in let's, let's say here, compared to 5D n equals one, or 4D n equals two, here are the vector has one scalar, 
and here the vector. As two scalars, and these, what I mean by these two scalars are, for instance, like in um, in cyber, the theory that Cyberg and Wooden studied, where they write down uh, effective action on the Coulomb branch. That Coulomb branch is a complex plane, and that complex plane are, are expectation values of these scalars. So, so this in 4D equals two would be a complex Coulomb branch. In 5D, n equals one, I go right here. We have a real Coulomb branch. And in, in six dimensions, there's no scalar, and so there's nothing like a Coulomb branch coming from the vector multiplets. But, but there is something like a vec, uh, Coulomb branch coming from another multiplet that I'll discuss in a second. Um, another thing about the vector multiplet is that um, its fermion has opposite chirality to the fermion in the hypermultiplet. And that, that's how they couple to each other. They couple uh, when a charged hypermultiplet gets a mass. Um, its superpartners are that the gageino here can pair up, like if we have a Higgs type mechanism, this gageino here can pair up with the fermion here with, with a term like Psi alpha lambda bar alpha bar delta alpha alpha bar something like that. Or this this is the scalar component of the hypermultiplet. So um, yeah, any any question about any of that so far? Okay, um, so one other multiplet that, to mention is the one zero tensor multiplet. And so let me just. We have, we, uh, in this work that I did with uh, Cordova and Dimitrescu, we studied these different multiplets and have these names for them based on their BPS shortening conditions. So uh, this one's name is C2. Uh, so, so this is, refers to a shortening condition. The two is the place where there's a null descendant. But the important thing here is that the bottom component is a real scalar. And its dimension is two, which is the free field dimension in six dimensions. Uh, because if we write d phi squared, that has dimension six. If phi has dimension two. And it's a R symmetry singlet. And then the, the supercharge takes this to one, zero, zero. Two and a half. It's a that's a R symmetry doublet, and then at the top of the multiplet is two zero 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 three, and this is a self dual two form. If I write it. If I write it this way, it looks like it has two symmetrized spinner indices. So two symmetrized spinner indices, but this we can relate that to, to anti-symmetrized. So these indices run from one to four. These indices run from one to six. We can relate that to an uh, anti-symmetrized uh, vector indices. And self-dual means that if we write this two form as x, then dx is a three form, which satisfies this kind of a self-duality condition. So, so this is a chiral, uh, chiral two form. 
or chiral boson, let's call it. Okay, and um, th this is actually, this, this, this field as a free field, the hypermultiplet is a free uh, superconformal field theory operator. It, it's in the classification of operators of the superconformal group. And the tensor multiplet is also a free operator of a superconformal field theories. We can have a superconformal field theories that aren't free with these operators. But if we just look at this as a free field, it's, it's a conformal field theory. And then we could also try to build up interacting theories from these components. But um, the reason why I mentioned that, that these are conformal field theories is because the vector, the vector multiplet is not, not a conformal field theory operator in D not equals to four. If you look at uh, a gauge field, uh, like a free Maxwell field is conformally invariant in four dimensions, but it's not conformally invariant in any other dimension just because a free Maxwell field always wants to have dimension one, and it's F mu nu always wants to have dimension two. And so then if we write down one over G squared, F mu nu, F mu nu, this thing should have dimension D if the, if the theory were conformally invariant, delta is D. These things have dimension two, and so one over G squared has dimension uh, d minus four. And so it's only dimensionless in four dimensions. For instance, in five dimensions, it has units of mass. So g squared is like a mass in 5D, for instance. And so this, this would be a theory, if we looked at a theory like this with this Lagrangian, this would be a theory that's scale but not conformally invariant away from four dimensions. In four dimensions, it's conformally invariant. Away from four dimensions, it's not conformally invariant. And um, yeah, so unlike, whereas, for instance, the tensor multiplet is conformally invariant. By the way, both, both the tensor multiplet and the vector multiplet, if we reduce down to five dimensions, become five dimensional vector multiplets. And, um, but in, in six dimensions, they're different. Okay, so this was some of the group theory I didn't quite get to. Um, yeah, any, any question on any of that? Uh-huh. Um, yeah, yeah. So, so the question was about what, why is there this condition of self-duality? So this, this self-duality, um, this, this, so this is just an example of a, of a multiplet that we can have in six dimensions. And so if we, if we have a multiplet whose bottom component is a Lorentz scalar whose dimension is two, um, and then we, if we look at what we get when we apply the supercharges, the, this is something where if we act with two supercharges, we happen to get something which is a self-dual two-form. And so that just comes because of the group theory of how we act with the supercharges. Like when we act with the supercharges, um, yeah, ba basically it's like we have to, uh, we end up symmetrizing in these spinner indices. And so it ends up being a self-dual two-form. And these self-dual two-forms, um, are, play a big role in six-dimensional theories. And the, the reason for that uh, is that, well, w w one comment about these self-dual two-forms is that um, yeah, so you can, you can think about the self-dual two-form as an analog of like a gauge field in other dimensions. So in other dimensions, we can have something like we can integrate over the particle world line, some gauge field, like dx mu. And so that's in the action. 
maybe I'll just write this as, as like a one form. So this is a one form. And if we have strings, we know that we can integrate some two form over the string world sheet. And so this x is like that, that kind of two form that we can integrate over this, this string world sheet. And the self-duality condition is some statement about the, um, well, one, one consequence of that, for instance, is that the charge lattice for these strings live in some self-dual lattice. Um, okay. Uh, any other question? Um, so actually just, also in parallel with I Igor's comments, the, um, the thing I'm about to say is a little bit similar to what I was talking about 28 years ago when I was talking about uh, conformal field theories based on Landau-Ginsberg uh, superpotentials. So now, now I'm about to talk about uh, string constructions of two zero theories where these superpotentials play some role in the geometry that can lead to them. So, so let's look at some string theory realizations. of uh, 60 supersymmetric theories. And actually, I, I wanted to start off discussing both 2-0 supersymmetry and 1-0 supersymmetry. Or, or sorry, 1-1 one, one supersymmetry. Here I was talking about 1-0. Now I want to talk about these two cases. And so these two cases have 16 supersymmetries. And this one, two, zero, is chiral. This one, one, is vector-like. And we know from, from what I was, for, we know from this classification of superconformal algebras that this one could possibly lead to a superconformal field theory because there are superconformal algebras based on two, zero supersymmetry, whereas this one can't. So, so this one can lead us to a, SCFT, whereas what, what about this one? This, these theories are infrared free. So they're kind of boring in the infrared. And, and what is a 1-1 one, one theory? So mostly I won't be interested in 1-1 one, one theories, but I'll, just to say a little bit about what it is. Um, a 1-1 one, one multiplet The basic 1-1 one, one multiplet is a 1-0 vector multiplet so it has some some gauge group and I I mentioned here that the vector multiplet isn't a conformal field theory operator so that fit, fits with the fact that 1-1 one, one theories can't be conformally invariant because they one of their basic things is this vector multiplet. I, I shouldn't be too hasty about saying that, though, because I'll mention that there are one zero conformal field theories with vector multiplets. So there is a way, actually, to get around this by using the tensor multiplet. So I'll, I'll discuss how, using a tensor multiplet, we can get conformal field theories from vector multiplets. But the one one theory doesn't have a tensor multiplet. It has a one zero vector multiplet plus a one zero hyper multiplet in the adjoint. So this, this is like how, for instance, uh, you can get n equals one supersymmetry by having n equals zero supersymmetry plus a fermion in the adjoint, or you could get n equals two from n equals one plus a chiral superfield in the adjoint, or you can get 
4 d n equals 4 from n equals 2 with a matter field in the adjoint. So here, if we have a hyper multiplet in the adjoint and a vector multiplet, we get 1, 1 uh, supersymmetry. And this theory has a, um, it has a global symmetry. Which, which is an SO4 R symmetry. So in, in terms of the algebra, we could write it as an SU2 right plus an SU2 left algebra. Um, and yeah, the, the theory is necessarily infrared free, so it's boring in the infrared. It, these theories, um, even though it's infrared free, there is a UV completion. As uh, so what's often called a little string theory. So I'll, I'll mention a little bit about these little string theories, but it's that's not really a subject that I was planning to discuss much, but I'll just mention it as kind of an aside. So this theory is infrared free, but it can be UV completed to a little string theory. And then this, this case can become a conformal field theory. So how do we get these? What, one way to get them is to start from type two string theory. So type two string theory, as, as you know, has 32 supersymmetries. Uh, in 10 dimensions, the supersymmetry is in the 16 of SO10. And so type 2 means that there are two 16s. And so that's 32 supersymmetries. And so here, these things have half the number of supersymmetry. And so what we need to do is to, is to get rid of half of the supersymmetry. And so we can get half of the supersymmetry either via brains Or, um, so we want to go to six dimensions and we want half the supersymmetry. So one way to get six dimensions and half the supersymmetry is by looking at five brains. So five brains, let's say, via BPS. BPS means it preserves half of the supersymmetries. Five brains. Or we can compactify. on a local Calabi Yau twofold. So local Calabi Yau means it breaks, Calabi Yau means it breaks half of the supersymmetry. And um, yes, maybe I'll go over here. So this local Calabi Yau twofold is a, um, if we wanted it to be compact, it would have to be K3. Um, but we don't actually care if it's compact. In fact, um, we're, we're interested, I, sh I should say here, that I just wanted to look at these theories as field theories. And so, so we want to take a decoupling limit. We don't, you don't have to decouple gravity if you don't want to, but I, I want to. So, um, so I'll decouple gravity. So I'm going to take m Planck to infinity. Um, the little string theory is, we, there's another parameter, which is m string. And if m string is finite, then it's the little string theory. Uh, I'll, I'll also take m string to infinity. So that will also decouple the string, any string modes. And, w and one way that we can do this is by taking the Calabi L to be a non-compact Calabi L. So the Calabi L twofold could have been K3 if compact. But if it's non-compact, that I'll talk about uh, ALE space.
And these non-compact ALE spaces have an ADE classification. And so here, these are, these are the simply laced Lie algebras, A, N, D, N, and E, six, seven, and eight. And there are a couple of ways to see that there's this ADE classification. One way is to say that this ALE space locally looks like, it, locally it looks like a cone. There's a conical singularity. And so there's a radial direction as we move away from the conical singularity. So we could picture it like, like here there's some singularity. And the singularity is what's gonna, is, is gonna be helpful because that's, that's where we're gonna get the interesting fields from, is from the singularity. So if we didn't have the singularity, it would actually be kind of boring. Um, so there's some singularity, and then at, at infinity, this is some four-dimensional space. So at infinity, there's some S3, and so this three sphere is the same as SU2, and then we can divide it out by some discrete subgroup of SU2. And these discrete subgroups of SU2 are like cyclic, dihedral, tetrahedral, octahedral, icosahedral. And that, there's a correspondence called the McKay correspondence between those discrete subgroups of SU2 and the ADE groups. So these, these things are labeled by, let's, let's say that there's some G, which is ADE. Another way to see the ADE classification is you could take um, we can describe these geometries as some polynomial in some complex variables x and y plus some other complex variable that's called z squared is zero in C3. So we could get a two-dimensional, um, we could get a two-complex dimensional space, which is this space, by looking at a surface in C3. And the surface has this form where this, these are Arnold's ADE uh, polynomials. And so, so this is another way to see that there's an ADE sync connection. This is related to the thing that I was talking about when it, uh, back in 1990 about two-dimensional conformal field theories based on these as super potentials. But, Anyway, here, here it's the, uh, related to the geometry. So, so th this is one thing we can do, is we can look at type two on that, on, um, that space, or we could look at half, um, half BPS brains. Yeah, so, so basically if we look at Type 2A on an ALE space, let's, let's say on um, ALE is for asymptotically locally Euclidean, and then it's also labeled by some group G, which is A, D, or E. So those are the uh, SUN, SO2N, um, and E678. Okay. Type 2A is non chiral, so if we compactify it on this, we get the 1 1 theory. So that's the non chiral theory. Or we could look at type 2B. And since type 2B is chiral, we get this chiral theory, the 2, 0, and 60. And actually, um, 2, 0 theories have an ADE classification. And um, so this construction naturally tells us that there's a connection between these 2, 0 theories and the groups A, D, and E. And it, it turns out that um, one can argue that they, they have to have this connection in general. Um, 
Okay, and then the other thing we can do is our vibrains. And so if type 2b, we could look at NS5 or D5 brains. Or more generally, PQ5 brains. So type 2b has an, has an SL2z symmetry. And so we can look at five brains which are, which we could think of as being like electric or magnetic or dionic. We could look, look at any of them. All of them by SL2Z symmetry. Um, yeah, all, all of them by, is it okay? Uh oh. Thank you. Um, yeah, all, all of them by SL2Z symmetry have the same, um, have the same world volume theory as a D5 brain. And D5 brains, we know the theory living in the world volume are gauge fields. And so gauge fields means it's 1, 1 supersymmetry. So these are all, all 1, 1. Or we could look at type 2A or uh, type 2A NS5 brains. Or it's better to, th to think about this, these type 2A NS5 brains as really being M5 brains. Um, and all of these give us 2, 0. Okay, so depending on whether we're interested in 1, 1, or 2, 0, we could get them from type 2A or type 2B in these different ways. Either brains or compactifying. Uh, yeah, any question? Uh-huh. No, yeah, so, so the question is, is, is it obvious that, that everything possible comes from string theory? And, um, no, that's not obvious, and yeah, especially once we start talking about one zero theories, there there are many theories that people wrote down just started thinking. Initially, the the idea that that they could exist came from string theory, but then once once people looked at kind of the basic building blocks, it was kind of conjectured that various other ones existed, and then um, you know, th then there was a series of papers by Heckman and Baffa and Morrison that argued that by using F, um, by, by using F theory and other collaborators, by using F theory, um, you could get all of those. And that's not at all obvious. Yeah, so there, there's no reason why, uh, why it has to be that string theory gives, uh, gives everything possible. We certainly know in, in four dimensions, lots of four dimensional quantum field theories that are very hard to realize from string constructions. But um, I mean, mostly like string constructions, uh, like, like for instance, if we're talking about, um, you know, like SUN or SON, it's easy to get things like matter in the fundamental or matter in some two index representation, but Sometimes other representations are harder to get, like three index representations or like spinner representations of SO groups. And uh, yeah, so definitely in four dimensions, we know that, that there are theories that I, I believe, as far as I know, that haven't been constructed from string theory. But in um, higher dimensions, we don't really have independent reasons to believe that those theories exist. So if we can get it from string theory, then that's good because then that gives us some, often some argument that the theory really does exist. Yeah, thanks. Uh -huh. This thing? Um, yeah, yeah, so, so we can always, we can always, um, if we have more supersymmetry, we can always try to decompose it into representations of the smaller supersymmetry. So it just happens that, it just so happens that if you wanted to write down, 
you can write down a, an algebra with one one supercharges. So so this means that there are both supercharges like Q alpha um, I. So these are the ones that are in the four and the two of the SU two R symmetry, and then there's some other supercharges. Let's call them Q bar, alpha bar, I bar, and they they satisfy a similar algebra. Uh, so, so these things satisfy the one, um, one zero algebra. So, so these are like satisfy a one zero algebra, and these satisfy like a zero one algebra, because they satisfy base, these ones by themselves satisfy the same algebra. But this, um, it has the opposite chirality for everything, and then when you put them together, you can get a one one symmetry. But what you find is that. Um, yeah, basically it's like this one, one zero hypermultiplet in the adjoint is what you would get if you started from the, the bottom operators in this multiplet. And if you act with, with the Qs, you get this one. And then when you act with the Q bars, you get like this multiplet. And yeah, so this, this is what often happens. Like if you want to try 40 N equals Four in terms of 4dn equals two. You can think about it as like 4dn equals two plus an adjoint hypermultiplet. And so, so this is like that. Any other question? Okay. Um, yeah, so. So the nicest, you know, the, the most pictorial way to think about uh, these two zero cases, which, which are the ones that I'm more interested in, is from this last description about in terms of M5 brains. So let's let's look at an M5 brain. In 11 dimensions. So an M5 brain means that it has five plus one uh, world volume. So we could take the world volume to be maybe like x0, x1 up to x5. And then there are the transverse directions, x6, 7, 8, 9, 10. So if I start with 0, I should go up to 10. And so there are five transverse directions. And, and in fact, one of, one of the two zero multiplets um, one of the basic two zero multiplets, just like we could decompose one one into one zero, um, so we could, we could decompose two zero multiplets into one one multiplets, or sorry, one zero multiplets. So this is just de decompose. And so there's one multiplet that has five scalars at the bottom of the multiplet, which are these five transverse directions. The reason why I know that it's at the bottom of a multiplet is because these are moduli. Like we could turn, we could move the brain in these tr transverse directions, and that doesn't break supersymmetry. And giving expectation values to some fields with the, and having them not break supersymmetry means they're at the bottom of the multiplet. And so, so these five transverse directions are scalars at the bottom of the multiplet. And in, in terms of one zero multiplets, this is one hyper plus one tensor. So the hyper multiplet had four scalars. And the tensor multiplet had one real scalar. And if we combine them together, we get these five scalars that are the transverse directions um, of, of an M5 brain. So the theory on a single M5 brain, if we, if we had just one M5 brain, 
then we get a free two zero multiplet, which is just this multiplet. It has these five transverse scalars plus super partners. Uh, the super partners we can read off from this, from this description. So among the super partners are, for instance, that chiral two form. Um, so it has some fermionic super partners in a chiral two form. And another thing that we can see nicely from, from this description is that there's an SO5 R symmetry. Actually, instead of calling it SO5, it's better to call it, because we have spinners, it's better to call it spin five. And this is the same thing as, as, um, as an SP group. Sometimes, sometimes I call it SP2, and sometimes I call it SP4, and sometimes people call it USP4. The, the rank of the group is two, and then the fundamental is a four-dimensional guy. And this is, in fact, the R symmetry that came, comes out from that classification that I mentioned in the first lecture from, from this NAMS classification. There's an um, SP, uh, SPN R symmetry, where SP1 would be uh, SU2. So, so the one zero theory had an SU2 R symmetry. This thing has an SO5 or spin five or SP2 or SP4 R symmetry. Um, yeah, so, so that's if we have a single M5 brain. And now we could look at what happens if we have, for instance, two M5 brains. So let's, let's say that we introduce another M5 brain. Now we know if we go down to, um, it, we know that if we were talking about D brains, what would happen would be that there would be strings connect them, connecting them. And those strings would give us like W bosons and when we bring the brains close together, we would get some enhanced gauge symmetry. Here, instead of having strings, the thing that connects them are M2 brains. So in M theory, there's a M2 brain, which if you wrap it around a circle becomes the, the fundamental string of type 2A, for instance. And, um, okay, so, so this M2 brain, when it ends on an M5 brain, this, this gives a string. From the point of view of a five-dimensional theory, that's like a string. And so when, when the five brains coincide with each other, it looks like the string becomes tensionless. coinciding M5s. It looks naively like it's giving us tensionless strings. So I, I said naively and I'm putting it in quotes because I'm gonna argue that, or mention this statement that that's not really the right interpretation. Um, well, b basically, this is what it looks like, and uh, Cyberg in maybe 95 or 96 argued that it's, it's, uh, it's still a quantum field theory, even though it looks like it has tensionless strings. And the idea is that um, even, even when we have, um, even in the case where, where these are like massless W bosons, like if we had two coinciding um, D brains, like let's say we have two D3 brains, when they coincide it looks like we have these W bosons that become massless, but really what happens is, is that those W bosons become part of a, a non-abelian gauge group. And they're not even gauge invariant. They become part of some non-abelian gauge group. And, and really, we shouldn't take those seriously as some, some things in the spectrum. They become kind of diffuse. And 
the spectrum, you know, like if we look at any, the n equals four theory, for instance, it doesn't have uh, gauge fields in its spectrum. It has some, just some operators. And so the argument here is that these tensionless strings also become some kind of non-gauge invariant analog of the W bosons. And really, instead, there's just some interacting quantum field theory there. Okay, so, so instead we get some super conformal field theory, which, which has this two zero symmetry. And these, this two zero super conformal field theory has been studied uh, using various methods. So the first way that it was studied was if we look at large n. So in the large n limit, there's ADS CFT. So we can describe this in terms of M theory on ADS seven times S four. So the, the SO five R symmetry is like the rotation symmetry of this S four, and. Um, by doing, by looking at that, one could check, for instance, that the kaluza klein modes on S4 give us like the half BPS operators with the right operator dimension. That's kind of guaranteed by the symmetries because ADS7 has the same symmetry as this uh, two zero super conformal group. And so, you know, there are various, the, the, the initial checks were all things that were kind of, to some extent, uh, guaranteed by the symmetries. One thing that, that came from this ADS seven times S4 description at large n was that the number of degrees of freedom, when you look in large n, what you do is you write down, all, all correlation functions end up being related to Newton's constant in seven dimensions. And then you can relate that to the 11-dimensional Newton's constant and the radius of the S4. And then the radius of the S4 is related to the units of flux, which is related to n. And so the number of degrees of freedom scales like this Newton's constant, which if you relate it to the units of flux, it's going like n cubed. So this is a different large n counting than, for instance, the D3 brains, where it goes like n squared, which is the usual large n counting. Here it's like going like n cubed. And so th this is kind of a characteristic feature of these two zero theories that ever since it was found, people have been trying to gain different insights into where that n cubed comes from. Um, that's one thing. Another way that it's been studied in recent years has, has been with the bootstrap approach. So there have been uh, papers from the Stony Brook group looking at, for instance, um, the SU2 version of this two zero theory, the theory that you get if you have just two coinciding uh, M5 brains and, and using the bootstrap to compute various quantities in that theory, like the conformal anomaly. Okay. And is there any question? I guess I don't have much time. Right, like five minutes. Um, okay. Yeah. So if we if we look at the structure of um, the two zero moduli space. Moduli spaces of vacua. For instance, like if we have n M5s, this, this leads to the um, type A n minus one to zero theory plus a decoupled to zero matter multiplet. The decoupled multiplet is just like the overall translational mode. 
this is, this is what, is what often happens with brains. Like if you look at parallel brains, it, you get like UN, and then you write that as SUN, and then the overall translations are like the U1 part. This, this one free piece is like the U1 part. And then th this is like the SUN part. And so the moduli space, look, what does it look like? It's R5 for translations in the five transverse directions to the nth power, because there are n of them. So, so this is the moduli space, including this extra free decoupled multiplet. So we take this thing to the nth power, and then we divide it by Sn, because these uh, brains are identical. And so we can, pr this is like permutations of the Sn. Okay, so, so this is some moduli space. It has some singularities. The singularities are where the brains coincide, and that's when there's some enhanced, not gauge symmetry, but enhanced 2-0 version of gauge symmetry. And um, yeah, and so, so if, we, if we look at the simplest example, let, let's look at the A1-2-0 theory. So it has a Coulomb branch. Where we give ex expectation values to um, the five scalars in the SU5. Um, the, the five scalars that ha are rotated by this SO5R symmetry. And so we could, for instance, break um, SO5 if we give an expectation value to these scalars, we could break it, for instance, to SO4. And so then, if we think about this as like a global symmetry, and this is some other remaining subgroup, then we get Goldstone bosons, G mod H, which is in the coset, which is S4, which is the same S4 that we have in the ADS seven times S4 construction. And, um, one of the ways that we can study the theory, for instance, is to look at the effective field theory for these Goldstone bosons. And so um, I won't, maybe um, in the next lecture I'll talk about anomalies, like Etoft anomalies and things like that. Like these theories, um, even though they don't have gauge fields, they have Etoft anomalies for the global symmetries. And we can write down, for instance, the fact that, that the global symmetries, Etoft anomalies have to match, it tells us that there's some interactions needed for these Goldstone bosons, which are analogs of the Weston Mina Witten interactions that we, for Goldstone bosons that we have in four dimensions that are also dictated by Etoft anomaly matching. Um, yeah, so, so basically everything from here on that I wanted to talk about in six dimensions hinges a lot on uh, properties of anomalies. So let's see, I have maybe one minute or, or it's time's up. Time's up, okay. So the next thing I'll talk about are properties of anomalies.